topic three is uh, called thermal physics and uh, this is a much shorter topic than what we've done in topic two. In fact, topic two is going to end up being by far the longest topic that we do and that's because I've also included things from topic one and also we talked about a lot of things that we're going to need later like working with vectors and scalars and units and all this. Um, so we can go along a little bit quicker and thermal physics is one that's actually uh, well, the very first step, I think, is being able to understand three main key definitions. So I'm going to go over them right now. These are worth memorizing. These often come up on exams, but they're also just you know, good to know if you're going to talk about thermal physics. Right? Thermal implies something about temperature or heat. You know, if you have thermal underwear, you know, that keeps you warm. I know in Canada we need that. Um, if you have a thermos, you know, it, it keeps your, let's say, hot chocolate uh, or tea or coffee or something really nice and warm. So thermal physics involves uh, the study of things that are hot so, or cold, I suppose. But uh, if we talk about in, uh, important definitions, uh, the very first one that I think is, is really important here is the word heat. And what does that actually mean? Now the heat is actually, um, it's a transfer. So I'm going to say it's a transfer of energy uh, between a system and its surroundings. Okay, that's going to be the definition of heat. Now we use a certain letter for uh, heat, or to denote heat. You might think like heat, oh it's hot here, but in physics we have a very precise definition, I think. So here we talk about heat as in, um, yeah, energy goes between a system and its surroundings. So you can have heat transfer and uh, one easy way to tell if you're going to have heat transfer is if the two are in the same temperature. So for example, if something's really hot and something else is really cold and you put them near each other, it turns out there will be a transfer of energy from hot to cold. In other words, heat will be a transfer of energy. Uh, it makes sense, you know, if something's really hot, you know, you put it near something really cold, the two will actually reach an equilibrium temperature. And it turns out what happens is the energy will go from the hot to the cold always unless you really force some things weird to happen. But in most natural systems, things go from hot to cold. So uh, the letter that we use to denote heat is actually capital Q. That's heat. Okay, so that's going to be heat and it's measured in units of joules because it's a unit of energy. So that's heat. Uh, the next thing that uh, we need to know, and this one comes up way more often, is temperature. Now that sounds really silly because uh, you say, well, what's the definite temperature? Uh, definition, sorry, a defin. That doesn't make any sense. Um, what's the definition of temperature? Well, you could say, well, I, I just know. I feel it's hotter in here or colder. But again, in physics, we have a very uh, specific definition for temperature. And here, this is the average kinetic energy of molecules. So in this case, in this room where I'm sitting, um, there's a certain temperature and that's because there's a bunch of molecules of air right now you know between where the camera is and me there's lots of molecules and they're floating around there's lots of different things I mean the very fact that you can hear me uh, means that I'm uh, you know I'm speaking and that means that I'm actually vibrating these molecules you might think they're actually going to the camera but I'm wearing a little microphone so they're actually just going here but um, you have to have these molecules to vibrate in order to have sound and it turns out these molecules, as they move around, because they're also in motion, as they move around, uh, they have a certain speed. And this speed is going to be related to kinetic energy. Remember we talked about that. Kinetic energy is just EK equals half MV squared. Don't forget about that equation. That's kinetic energy. Is half times the mass times the speed squared. So the faster that they go, the more energy they have. Now the reason why this is important is because, think about this now, this is the average by the way, it doesn't mean all of them are going this uh, speed. So some of, them, uh, some of them have a certain energy, some of them have more energy, some of them have less. And in fact, that explains how you can have evaporation. Imagine you have um, a whole bunch of water. 
in that water, these molecules are going to be moving around. Okay? And some of them have larger speed. And remember, speed means energy. So if something has a larger speed, that means it has a larger energy. So some of them will have enough speed to actually escape. Right? That's why sometimes, uh, you know, if you have uh, a bunch of water, give it enough time, it'll actually go down the level of water. And that's because some of them escape into the atmosphere. That's because temperature is only the average kinetic energy. In other words, some are higher, some are lower. That's the whole point of an average. You know, if you look at all your different grades on tests, you might have an average of, I don't know, uh, five, let's say. Well, if your average is five, you might have actually had some higher and some lower. Same thing with the energy of these molecules. So what we use to denote temperature, well, this is actually pretty easy. It's just T. That equals the temperature. I'm just going to short form and say temp. And it's measured in degrees Celsius, or we tend to use K for Kelvin. And Kelvin and Celsius are very similar scales. They go up by the same amount. In other words, if you go up by one degree Celsius, you've also gone up in temperature by one degree Kelvin. The only difference is the zero point of these. Right, the zero point of uh, Celsius is based on the freezing uh, point of water. So in that sense, it's zero degrees Celsius is where water freezes, and 100 degrees Celsius is where water is uh, boiling. And so that's how we've sort of defined that scale. And it turns out very close to that, as long as you have, um, well, the, the zero point of the Celsius scale is set at zero degrees Celsius, but it turns out that things can actually be colder than that. Right? So that's why uh, we use this scale of Kelvin. It's a little bit more straightforward to use once you're used to it because uh, it's absolute. Because in other words, the zero point of Kelvin really is zero. In other words, nothing can get colder than that. In fact, scientists have gotten really, really, really close to zero degrees Kelvin. You can't quite reach it, and it turns out there's lots of reasons why um, molecular motion is thought to perhaps stop. Um, but it turns out that zero degrees Kelvin is just minus 273.15-ish. Uh, but most people just use minus 273 degrees Celsius is zero degrees Kelvin. And nothing can get colder than that. But these two scales, at least the good news is, if you're talking about a temperature difference, it doesn't matter if you use Celsius or Kelvin because they go up by the same amount. In other words, the distance from one degree to the next degree is the same. Like I said, the, the only uh, difference here is that uh, Kelvin has a different starting point. So zero Kelvin is just, is just pushed over, that's all. Uh, so we use temperature here, and the key thing here to know is that faster molecules implies hotter temperature. All right, this is, I think that's the sort of, that's the take home sort of thing here. That's the thing to really get here and to understand is that if, your molecules are moving faster, right? V is larger, and that means then they'll have a higher energy, a kinetic energy, and that means that the temperature is higher. So faster molecules means hotter temperature. Conversely, slower ones means colder. And that's why sometimes we say that molecular motion stops at zero degrees Kelvin, because how slow can they go? Well, they can pretty much stop. And if they stop, that's about as cold as it can get. So that's sort of the idea with uh, zero degrees Kelvin. And then we have a very last um, thing to talk about, which is internal energy. Okay, so that one, uh, that's just the total kinetic energy plus potential energy. Now that's the total of the inside. That's not the total of the entire system because we could talk about, um, let's say I have a box of molecules. In there they've got kinetic energy because they're moving, right? They have a temperature. They also have potential energy. It turns out they can have stored energy. Uh, they can be seen sometimes as little springs. You can imagine molecules as little springs so they have stored energy. And in that sense then uh, you could say, well that means that's the internal energy. Great. But what if I take that box and I throw the box? I actually haven't changed the internal energy. In other words, it's only the total kinetic plus potential energy of the box you're looking at. It's not, you know, 
if the box moves, then you actually ignore the moving box because, of course, something moving will also have its own energy associated with it. So the key thing just to remember, though, is that it's kinetic plus potential. And in fact, we use the letter U for that. So U is going to be the internal energy and it's measured in, well, you guessed it, hopefully, joules, because energy always seems to be measured in joules. So these are, here are the key things here, okay? There's heat, there's temperature, and there's internal energy. And those things then come up a lot within the thermal physics unit, and they're very important definitions. These are key to our understanding of what actually goes on.